I invite you to take your Bibles at this time and turn to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, where we are at in our verse-by-verse, chapter-by-chapter study of the book of Acts. And it's been a few weeks since we were in Acts, so our study's a little disjointed, but at least for the next three Sundays, we're going to be in Acts. And we're in chapter 2, and as you know, the book of Acts is all about the church of Jesus Christ and its witness for Christ to the ends of the earth. And it's a historical book. It's a unique book in the New Testament in that regard. And as I think of historical incidents throughout history, there are some very important dates that many of you perhaps know, but let's do a little quiz to stir up your mind before we dive into the book of Acts. As we think of important dates in history, I'm going to throw out a date for you, and maybe you can tell me what was so significant about this date. October 31st, 1517. Don't say the first official Halloween. No? Well, if you guessed that that was the day that Martin Luther tacked the 95 Theses on the Wittenberg Castle door, you would be correct. That is usually considered the spark of the Reformation, very important event in world history. Well, here's an easy one. Here's a softball one for all of you Americans. July 4th, 1776. You better know this date if you live in the United States of America. Of course, that was the day that the Declaration of Independence was signed in Philadelphia, declaring our independence from Great Britain. How about April 9th, 1865? The Civil War. Well, what about the Civil War? That was the official end where a truce or the Union officially was declared the winner and the Confederate conceded. How about June 19th, same year, 1865? Juneteenth is now considered a holiday. That was the Emancipation Day when the slaves in Texas, though the war had ended back in April, word didn't get to them until June 19th. They were actually practically still slaves, even though legally they were judicially and legally free prior to that. It's a great picture, by the way, of many times in our Christian life, how though because of Calvary and the resurrection, we can have freedom and newness of life if we don't walk in knowledge of that truth and don't reckon that to be true, we will still be practically in bondage. How about this date? As we think of uh, American history, June 6, 1944. Well, something about this, the World War II, D-Day, that's right. The great landing on Normandy Beach, where the United States and British forces joined together and marked the turning point of World War II. How about May 14th, 1948? Hey, you guys are, you should be historians. You're pretty good. I, some of these are kind of easy, I know, but we should all know these. This was the official birth date of the modern state of Israel. Of course, Israel was a nation prior to that, but it was reborn, in essence, as a nation on that day when it declared its independence. And as soon as it was independent on that day, guess what happened? It was attacked by its enemies. They had to go to war right from the cradle, so to speak. How about this date, May 24th, A.D. 33? Any guesses? That would be the day of Pentecost that we read about in Acts chapter 2. If Harold Honer's chronology is correct, and I think he's as better studied on this subject than anybody else, he, he believes the crucifixion of Christ was April 3rd, AD 33. You do the math, 50-plus uh, days after that, you come to a Sunday, May 24th, AD 33, for Pentecost. Pentecost, we know, occurred 50 days after Christ rose from the dead that Sunday morning as he rose on the third day. If he was crucified on a Friday and rose on a Sunday morning, you go ahead 50 days, you come to the day of Pentecost. So this is a very significant date in terms of world history. In fact, the occasion we're going to read about in Acts chapter 2 was far more important than any of those other historical dates that we just looked at. Because it was on that date that the Spirit of God came 
And the dispensation of the church officially began and has begun for some 2,000 years. And the church will continue to exist into eternity, though nations come and nations go. And so we've seen in recent studies in Acts chapter 2, the beginning of the church with the descent of the Holy Spirit manifested through the sign of the flames of like tongues that looked like flames of fire above their heads and the speaking in tongues and the great sound that occurred. And we know from the ministries of the Holy Spirit that we've seen recently that it was this baptism by the Holy Spirit that placed the church in union with Jesus Christ. And the church was born on that day. The disciples were also filled with the Spirit for ministry on that same occasion. Now what we also see in Acts chapter 2 was these disciples began to speak in the languages or dialects of 16 different people groups or regions that had come of Jews from the diaspora back to Jerusalem to celebrate this great feast of Pentecost. And there was a huge crowd that had assembled in Jerusalem. Josephus the historian tells us that crowds of upwards of 100,000 would come from outside the land of Israel for Passover, some 50 plus days before, and many thousand would stay 50 more days for Pentecost as well. And we know that 3,000 of them got saved on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. So there are people from all over the world coming to Jerusalem on this amazing occasion. And there was the miraculous speaking in tongues we see in chapter 2. Now as I had you turn to chapter 2, look at the end of all this in verse 11, where it says, We hear them speaking in our own tongues or languages the wonderful works of God. Technically, they were not speaking the gospel message in tongues or these foreign languages, but they were speaking about God's miraculous signs and wonders, as we saw in our last study, because the Greek term for wonderful works occurs in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, and it describes in particular God's miraculous signs and wonders. That's what they were proclaiming. There is no explanation of how to be saved here recorded in these verses 4 through 11 when they spoke in these languages. That's going to come later with the Apostle Peter as he preaches the gospel in verses 22 through 40 in the common tongue of Hebrew or Aramaic. So how did the crowd respond to the disciples speaking in tongues? Well, verses 12 and 13 tell us, they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others mocking said they are full of new wine. And so the Lord uses this amazing miracle of tongues to capture their attention, to set things up for the preaching of the gospel message. And some responded positively and knew that this had to be from God, and others mocked and rejected it. Now, if you were Peter on that day, what message would you proclaim to these fellow Jews who had assembled from all over the world? In fact, how would you answer this mocking and this response of what could this mean? Or they are full of new wine. Well, we know that Peter refers to Scripture. In fact, he was ready to go, so to speak, with the Word of God on the launching pad of his thinking as he was prepared for this occasion. Now, he quotes for us from Joel 2, verses 28 through 32. So let's continue reading in verse 14 and see Peter's response. He says, it says, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour, which would be 9 a.m., and this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. 
And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, why did Peter quote from this passage in Joel 2, verses 28 through 32? And how does this relate to the Jews and their expectation about the coming of the Holy Spirit in the kingdom age? Well, I'm not going to, for time's sake, go back and read with you Ezekiel and Zechariah, those two prophets, but you can read these passages that are here on your handout and on the PowerPoint on your own. I would encourage you to look them up. What they tell us is that during that kingdom age, which is after the cross, after the church age of grace, it is yet to come when Jesus Christ returns back to the earth. During that age that the Jews look forward to in the Old Testament, it will be an age characterized by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. In fact, read those passages on your own and you will see that, that the Spirit of God is mentioned in connection with that coming kingdom. And that's why in this passage he mentions the Spirit in verse 17 and in verse 18 because it was something that they could relate to. You see, the coming of the Holy Spirit was in connection with the new covenant being fulfilled which was promised to Israel. And that is just like the land covenant, Davidic covenant, new covenant, all based on the Abrahamic covenant. Those were not promised to the church but rather to Israel. And so the Jews should have understood that the Holy Spirit would come with the coming of Messiah. Now technically, Peter here was not saying that the church is the kingdom or that the church is fulfilling the covenants to Israel. Because remember, the church was an Old Testament mystery. It was hidden. From the vantage point of the Old Testament prophet looking forward, they couldn't see a church, but what they could see were the two comings of Messiah at his first coming to suffer and die for our sins and at his second coming to come in glory and great power and set up his kingdom. And so from their perspective, from a distance, they were like two mountain peaks superimposed. They didn't see the valley of the church in between. It wasn't revealed. They couldn't have known that. Now going back to verse 16, why then does Peter actually quote from Joel and say in verse 16, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Was he saying that Joel's prophecy was literally fulfilled here on the day of Pentecost? No, he wasn't. Not at all. I would explain it this way, that since the church was an Old Testament mystery, and there are no verses in the Old Testament about the church or the baptism by the Holy Spirit, remember we saw in a previous study that's unique to the church age, Peter used the supernatural ministries of the Spirit mentioned in Joel 2 in connection with the second coming of Christ to set up his kingdom. He used that as an analogy for the Jews to understand what was happening on the day of Pentecost without claiming that Joel 2 was being literally fulfilled, only that it was similar or analogous to what Joel predicted. And to the Jewish mind, knowing Old Testament prophets and about the Spirit of God's ministry, they could have made that connection. And so, in verse 16, when he says, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, I believe, in essence, what he's saying is, this is like what Joel was saying. And we know that it wasn't literal, because that passage speaks of these great signs and wonders, you know, with the moon and the sun, you know, turning into blood or turning into darkness and such. And that will happen in the days of the tribulation, after the church has been raptured and before the Lord Jesus returns back to the earth to set up his kingdom. So Joel 2 is in reference to the coming tribulation period, right before Christ's second coming. But he uses this to answer them. And what I find amazing about all this is Peter knows scripture. He was ready on the spot with this scripture passage from Joel, and he quotes several verses Maybe he had a copy of Joel right in his hands, but I tend to think more likely he had it memorized and he was ready when they had their objections. 
that they are drunk with new wine. And he says, oh no, this is like what Joel was speaking of. Would you be so ready with knowledge of the Word of God to answer objections like that? Now, we've seen in several studies about tongues in Acts chapter 2, and we're not going to backtrack and review all of that, but I do want to bring that to a conclusion and emphasize a certain, uh, certain key points, and that is that when it comes to authentic spirituality, as the New Testament views it, the emphasis is certainly not on tongues or these sign gifts. They were temporary to fulfill a specific purpose for the birth of the church, for the establishment of the authority of the apostles, and to confirm the Word of God that is now written in the canon of Scripture, the New Testament, which is closed. So with respect to the Bible, we are to view all claims of supernatural manifestation through the Word of God and put the Bible above experience rather than what is often happening today in many charismatic and Pentecostal cir circles in which experience is put over the Bible and the Bible is interpreted in light of the experience instead of vice versa. And when it comes to Jesus Christ, oftentimes in those circles, as we saw in previous studies, the emphasis is on the supernatural manifestation and, and the spectacular and the spiritual gift itself rather than on Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 15, verse 26, before he was crucified and rose and ascended to the Father, but when the Helper comes, that's the Holy Spirit, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. He'll testify of me, Jesus says. So the true emphasis of spirituality in the New Testament, in this age of grace, is a focus upon the Lord Jesus Christ. If somebody claims to be spiritual, and they claim to have all these gifts, and they're not preaching a true gospel, or they're not emphasizing the Lord Jesus, but rather even the Holy Spirit versus the Lord Jesus, you know that that's not genuine spirituality. In fact, what is emphasized in the New Testament is far more the fruit of the Spirit in terms of the characteristics of Christ-likeness, namely love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, etc. Those sorts of things rather than spiritual gifts. That's why the Corinthians had all the spiritual gifts and yet they were carnal, Paul wrote. What a tragedy. And so what we see here on the day of Pentecost is a unique experience of speaking in tongues to all these different people groups all at once there in Jerusalem. And Jesus Christ, in essence, tees it up for the disciples to preach the gospel message. And so we see in the rest of Acts 2 here the evangelistic preaching or message of the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost, verses 22 through 40. And we have much ground to cover here, so we're going to move quickly through this passage. But let me just emphasize this, that as we come to verses 22 through 40, we have the most extensive record of Peter's preaching in the book of Acts, or anywhere in the New Testament for that matter. Some 18 or 19 verses there in chapter 2. This is similar to Paul's ministry, where we have an extensive record of his gospel preaching, put in chapter 13, where he is among the churches of Galatia. And so under the Spirit of God, Luke, who's writing the book of Acts, puts forth for us two long records of the two main apostles, Peter and Paul, of what they preached. Now as we think of Peter's preaching, if you had the opportunity to speak to Jews about Jesus Christ on the day of Pentecost, what would you choose to say? What did Peter say? And what can we learn from his evangelistic preaching? There are several lessons here. So we're going to work through a number of these passages, some of them a little bit difficult to interpret, but we're going to unpack it, and by the grace of God and the Spirit of God, learn from this great section of Scripture. First of all, we see four reasons that Peter gives to these Jews to believe that Jesus is the Christ, another name for the Messiah. 
And that is the main point that he's going to get to in verse 36. And the first reason he gives in verses 22 through 24 is Jesus Christ had a supernatural life that was undeniable. And his God's sovereign plan was established through that. So we see a supernatural life and God's sovereign plan as his first proof. Verses 22 through 24, he goes on to say, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by, by God, by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Now, first of all, what we see in Peter's preaching here is an emphasis upon Jesus. He should be the spotlight of the gospel message. The good news, after all, is about a person, Jesus Christ, and what he accomplished. Jesus of Nazareth. And secondly, it goes on to say that it was... The miracles, wonders, and signs he did, and these were from God the Father as the source and through the Spirit of God. These came from God, not from Beelzebub, as the religious leaders had falsely accused Jesus of, doing his miracles through satanic means. No, he wasn't an imposter. He was the real deal. And the Old Testament, again, said that when the Messiah comes, he will be anointed by the Spirit of God and do his work miracles through that means, just as it says right here. So if Jesus did his miracles through the power of the Holy Spirit, what does that say? That the king had come to Israel. Now how did Jesus' miracles prove he was the Christ? Well, let's take one Old Testament passage, Isaiah 35, verses 4 through 6. It had prophesied this, Say to those who are fearful-hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, and that will happen at the second coming of Christ. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you, and he will come to rescue Israel. We know that. Verse 5 and 6 go on to say, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For waters shall burst forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. I think there's a book by that title that people have found very edifying. But these are manifestations that will occur when Messiah appears. And the Jews should have known this from their Old Testament scriptures. That's why regarding John the Baptist, remember he sent messengers to the Lord Jesus and asked him, are you the coming one or do we look for another? And partly he's wondering that because he's sitting in jail about to have his head cut off, persecuted. So if you're the king, and the kingdom of God is here, or about to come, why am I sitting in jail? Why does evil and sin still prevail? That was a legitimate question. So are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, these messengers of John, go and tell John the things which you hear and see, namely, the blind see and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the good news preached to them. The very things that Isaiah had predicted would happen when the Messiah came. And so Jesus gave a little foreview of the coming kingdom to prove that he was the real king. They could not dispute, these Jews in Acts chapter 2, that Jesus had truly done many, many miracles for the last Three years. So in Acts 2, verse 22, Peter reminds them of the supernatural life and the power of God doing miracles through him. But he goes on in verse 23, where we see the sovereignty of God in the life of the Lord Jesus. It says, Him being delivered by the determined purpose, horismene bule, those are two words for the foreordained will of God, and foreknowledge prognose, in which we get prognosis of God. You have taken by lawless hands of crucified and put to death. What we see here is a balance between divine sovereignty and human responsibility. 
even though in the foreknowledge of God and his omniscience, he saw that Jesus Christ was going to suffer at the hands of his own people, that doesn't mean that God caused the sin of the Jews in rejecting their Messiah. God forbid that he should do that. No, God doesn't cause any sin at all, but he does foreknow it, and he does factor it into his will and his plan, and yet he holds man accountable. And the reason I say this is because many Calvinists look at verse 23 as a proof text to link together foreknowledge and the predetermined will of God. And they say that foreknowledge equals predestination. And that is completely false from Scripture. In fact, that would mean that God is responsible for the sin of these Jews, and God forbid. No, there's a perfect balance between God's sovereignty and even his foreknowledge and man's responsibility. Now, when it comes to this word for foreknowledge, we have right in the book of Acts, later in chapter 26, a use of this term here in the verb form. In chapter 2, it was the noun form. Same word, though. And notice how it's used here. Paul says, My manner of life from youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, all the Jews know. They knew me from the first. They foreknew, you could say if they were willing to testify that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. So Paul uses this term, and here he's clearly not saying that you Jews who knew about my youth, you know, foreordained that I would turn out a Pharisee and that sort of thing. No, he's not saying that. So clearly it just simply means prior knowledge. And how could God not know all the free will choices of human beings down through history if he's truly omniscient. So foreknowledge is an aspect of his omniscience. It is not synonymous with, his, with a sovereign deterministic foreordination. But going on in chapter 2 here, we see in verse 24 the central point in Peter's preaching, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Notice all the things God has done to this point. Verse 22 says, A man attested by God through these miracles, which God did through him in your midst. And then verse 23, Even his crucifixion at the hands of these Jews, God foreknew and was part of his eternal plan. And then verse 24, God raised him up. In other words, Jesus Christ as the Messiah here in these passages has the fourfold stamp of being of God. This was not a ministry from the will of man. All of this was the will of God the Father and the Spirit of God through the Lord Jesus. But notice verse 24, He raised Him up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that He should be held by it. And it's very interesting, this expression, not possible, is underscored in Luke's writings, whether it's the Gospel of Luke or the book of Acts, through a term that's used, namely day, in Greek, to speak of something that is a necessity. Notice Luke 24, verse 7. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. Or Luke 24, 44. These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And then in chapter 3, we'll get to this passage, verse 21. Whom heaven must receive until the time of restoration of all things, which, was, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. You see that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was an event that was absolutely necessary. God was going to make it happen after he had been taken by wicked men and crucified. It was all part of his plan. And so we see the supernatural and the sovereign behind the life, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Reason number two to believe that Jesus is the Christ is stated in verses 25 through 31, namely because of David's scriptural prophecy, as he's going to quote from the Psalms here again, particularly about his resurrection. David's scriptural prophecy about Christ's resurrection. 
Going on in verses 25 through 28, we read, For David says concerning him, and now he quotes from Psalm 16, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One, a term for the Messiah or the anointed king, to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Now what passage does Peter specifically quote here? Well, it's Psalm 16, verses 9 through 11. A prophecy of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in so doing, Peter is preaching the gospel message, the good news to his fellow Jews. Remember from passages elsewhere in the New Testament, like 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, as well as Romans 1, verse 1 and 2, or 1 through 4, it says that the gospel message, which is about our Savior's death and resurrection, was according to the Scriptures. Well, what passage in the Old Testament highlights his resurrection? Well, it's especially verses 9 through 11 of Psalm 16. And this was not a psalm about David himself and his own deliverance from a state of death, like escaping near misses at the hands of his adversaries. No, this was definitely a prophecy as David foresaw the resurrection of the Messiah. How do we know that? Well, Peter gives us the interpretation. Going on in verses 29 through 31, it says, Men and brethren, after he gives the quote, now as a good expositor of Scripture and his evangelistic preaching, he gives the explanation. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. He's right over there, Peter's saying, in essence. So obviously this passage wasn't fulfilled in David because he's still buried. Verse 30, therefore, being a prophet... And David was a prophet, he wrote scripture, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne, he foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Now, specifically, he makes mention of David here. He also makes mention of how God had sworn an oath to him that from the fruit of his own body there would come a descendant of his who would reign on his throne. That would be the Messiah. As we just read in our scripture reading this morning from Matthew chapter 1, the genealogy or lineage of the Lord Jesus, he was not only a son of Abraham, but also through the tribe of Judah and also through King David the Davidic lineage. And this is all in keeping with that great covenant that God had made with David in 2 Samuel 7, the Davidic covenant it's sometimes called, in which a descendant from his own body would be the heir to the throne of Israel. And so Peter is quoting scripture here, proving his points from the Old Testament scriptures. And then he alludes to another passage in Psalm 132, verse 11, which makes mention of the Messiah coming from David's body, it says, The Lord has sworn in truth to David, he will not turn from it. I will set upon your throne the fruit of your body. And that's exactly what Peter was emphasizing in his interpretation of Psalm 16 here in Acts chapter 2. So we've seen two reasons so far that Jesus is the Christ, now he gives a third, a third reason to believe that he's the Christ, and that is because the apostles were witnesses of his resurrection. Verse 32, it says here, Peter goes on, this Jesus, this one who was prophesied and predicted, foreseen by David, this Jesus God raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Remember, after Christ's resurrection from the dead, he was with his disciples for some 40 days, 
before he was caught up at his ascension. And so he was seen over and over by his disciples. During that time, he gave them the Great Commission. He taught them about the kingdom and Israel and various things. But he was also seen by his disciples. It says in 1 Corinthians 15 that at one point he was seen by over 500 of them in his resurrection body. And these 500 went out witnessing and testifying to what they had seen. By the way, when it comes to being a witness for Christ, God is just asking you to share what you know. I think one of the best ways that you can uh, t testify or be a witness for Christ is to share your testimony of how the Lord saved you and share the scripture passages the Lord used in your life to convince you of the gospel of his saving grace with others. In fact, at holiday time, it's a great opportunity to do that as you're often with many unsaved family and relatives or coworkers. And these eyewitnesses of his resurrection testified. In fact, they sealed their testimony in many cases with their blood. We've already seen in our study of the apostles, the twelve, that virtually every one except for John went to their graves testifying to what they had seen. Now, do false witnesses usually lay down their life to defend and protect a lie? No. And when you've got 500 witnesses alive in the first century, you could cross-examine one, compare it to the other, and their testimonies would align, and you could corroborate their stories. The testimony of these apostles and disciples was undeniable. And this is what they had been commissioned to do. Remember the key verse in the book of Acts, Acts 1, verse 8? Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be what as a result? Witnesses to me, starting in Jerusalem, and then Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And that's why when it came to replacing the spot of Judas Iscariot as one of the twelve, with Matthias who was selected, it says in verse 22, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these who is to be selected to fill Judas's spot, must become a witness with us of what, in particular? His resurrection. So the resurrection is being emphasized over and over here. Why? Well, this may not be something that we emphasize here in our Western culture, which is very Christianized in terms of the message that many in our culture already have heard and believed, but this would be the starting point for these Jews. In fact, if they were going to put their trust in Jesus Christ as the sacrificial substitute for their sins, how could they believe that his death was actually a worthy sacrifice that paid for all their sin in full if he was dying in his own place for his own sins as an imposter Messiah and he deserved that death? You see, what validated the worth of his death and what it accomplished was his resurrection. So Peter's emphasizing, look guys, he really did rise from the dead in proof of Old Testament scripture. And what that should cause you to see is that yes, he really did die as that sacrificial, substitutionary, satisfactory Lamb of God that Isaiah 53 and other passages prophesied about. That's the value of the resurrection. That's why it's an essential element of the gospel, as we will see. But going beyond the resurrection, he now speaks of Christ's ascension to the right hand of God in verses 33 through 35. <coughs> Therefore, Peter says, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens... But he himself says, in Psalm 110.1, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Notice again he's quoting these psalms that David himself spoke, showing that David did not fulfill these things, though he predicted them. These could only be fulfilled in the Messiah. You see, to be at the right hand of God would be equivalent to being equal in deity with God himself. 
And what we see from this quote, from Psalm 110.1, which is, by the way, the most often quoted Old Testament passage in the New Testament to support who Jesus is as the true Messiah. This is a key text in the early church. What this shows is that the Messiah would not only be from David's body, but he would be David's Lord. Let's look back at that passage for a moment. Verses 34 and 35. The Lord said to my Lord. Now if David is writing that, the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah God, said to my Lord, David says, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Then obviously David is referring to somebody besides God the Father and himself because David had a Lord who would sit at the right hand of God the Father. Who would that be? And that's why this passage was quoted to the religious leaders in Jesus' day by Jesus, and they couldn't answer him. And it's repeated by Peter here. This passage very clearly underscores the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, a fourth reason that Jesus is the Christ is stated in verses 33 through 35, which we've just seen, and that is because the promised Holy Spirit was proof of Jesus' ascension to God's right hand. How do we know? How did these Jews know here in Jerusalem that Jesus really did ascend to the right hand of God? By this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which they could not deny, though they, some of them mocked and said they're drunk, but they're speaking in languages of 16 different languages or dialects from around the ancient world. There was a great sound that occurred that was heard in Jerusalem, and there was the manifestation of these flames of tongues above their heads. Undeniably, this was the Holy Spirit, and this was sent. He was sent by the Lord Jesus, proving his deity, proving his ascension from this earth. Now I want you to understand the logic behind Peter's point here. And in order to do that, you have to remember what was predicted by John the Baptist and the Lord Jesus regarding the coming of the Holy Spirit. Remember John the Baptist had predicted, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me, namely Jesus, is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So if Jesus comes along and he takes the Holy Spirit, who is deity, and baptizes people with that Holy Spirit, what does that say about the one who sends the Holy Spirit? He must be the highest in authority. He must be fully God. And the Lord Jesus had said in John 15, 26, a passage we already made reference to, But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. Notice the Holy Spirit will come from the Father and the Son. He proceeds from both. What does that say about Jesus? What does that say about the Trinity? All three members are fully God in deity. In the one being who is God, there are three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's what we see in these passages. Now, this passage is also misinterpreted by all millennialists and progressive dispensationalists with respect to the Davidic covenant. And let me be technical here for a moment. When it comes to dispensations, we believe clearly that in the prior dispensations, whether it was the covenant promised to Abraham, that was the beginning of the Israelite nation. Abraham had descendants. Isaac, Jacob, the 12 tribes, etc., formed the nation of Israel. They were brought to Mount Sinai under Moses and given the law, and that was a dispensation for 1,500 years up to the cross, but that dispensation ended. Remember, the temple veil was ripped from top to bottom. God had canned that system as a dispensation to live under, and that's why when we come to Acts chapter 2, he begins a new dispensation or economy of grace, of the Holy Spirit, the church age, in which now he's calling out Jew and Gentile for some 2,000 years 
from Pentecost to the rapture to form one body in Christ. It's a separate dispensation. And then after the seven years of tribulation, the rapture, the rapture occurs before the tribulation. Seven years of tribulation will transpire. At the end of that time, Christ will return to the earth. Then he'll set up his thousand-year kingdom. And then will come the kingdom dispensation, where he rules with a rod of iron, the Old Testament and Scripture teaches. But there are those today who want to form a compromised position between traditional dispensationalism, biblical dispensationalism, and amillennialism, the teaching that there really is no coming 1,000 millennial years of a kingdom, that, in fact, is being fulfilled in some spiritual sense during the church age. That's what amillennialism teaches, rather than premillennialism, which we hold to. And so what they often have to do is take the Old Testament promises of the coming kingdom age and water them down to make them fit the current age. They spiritualize them or allegorize them rather than taking them literally. And then you have progressive dispensationalists who want to form a compromised position because it's academically respectable to not just take the Bible so literally all the time. You know, how could you be so ignorant? as to just believe everything at face value. You've got to have a twist on something. So this is a compromise position. Progressive dispensationalism, it's called. And by the way, haven't you noticed that whenever Satan wants to sell a system that really isn't biblical, he slaps the label progressive on it, or it's always something better, new, and improved, right? Like the Respect for Marriage Act that's going through Congress. Really? Redefining biblical marriage between a man and a woman? Now anything goes? Yeah, but it's the Respect for Marriage Act. Well, it disrespects the marriage plan that God set up as you look at it biblically. That's a whole other subject, but you get my point. So progressive dispensationalism really isn't progressive, it's regressive. It's going back to amillennialism. And what they do is they have this already, not yet perspective. They'll say, well, yeah, there is still a coming 1,000-year kingdom. We're still premillennial, but it's already being fulfilled now in the church age in some sense so they can satisfy both camps and get along with both, they think. And they teach that Jesus Christ is already reigning right now on David's throne in heaven, and thus the Davidic covenant is all, has already been inaugurated with the coming of Jesus at his first coming, just like the other covenants, they say. And this is problematic for several reasons. Number one, that interpretation confuses Jesus being at the right hand of God in heaven with Jesus sitting on the throne of David, which is always an earthly throne, as it's described in Scripture. Yes, Jesus is at the heavenly right hand of God, but that is not the same as being on the throne of David. Two different thrones. This interpretation also misses the point of Acts 2.25-35, through 35, that being not the establishment of David's throne, but Jesus being David's descendant. That's the whole point. That Jesus is the true Messiah in the lineage of David. Not to say that that throne is already established. That will come at his second coming to the earth. Thirdly, Luke 1 verses 67 through 74 says fulfillment of the Davidic covenant will include deliverance from all of Israel's national enemies. Is that happening now? From 1948 to the present, has it been peaceful for the nation of Israel? Hardly, just the opposite. Fourthly, David's rule as king, as we think of the historical life of David, you know, 1000 B.C., when he was anointed by Samuel to be king of Israel, did he take over right away and say, Saul, move over. David's going to reign now as of today. Didn't happen. In fact, he was hunted by Saul, persecuted for a number of years, and that's why he wrote many of the Psalms that are so edifying to us as God let him go through great trials. God used those in his life to refine David. But he didn't take over as king right away, just because he was anointed. 
And the same is true at the first coming of Christ. Just because his first coming validated his Messiahship doesn't mean he started to reign right away. There was an interval of time before the inauguration of his rule. The same will be true of Christ, though it's obviously longer 2,000 years for Jesus as opposed to David's period of having to wait until Saul was removed. <coughs> and so there's a difference between the throne of David and the throne of God. Now going on in this passage, he comes to a climactic point here in verse 36 in Acts 2. He says, therefore, notice the therefores. Peter is making several points in his preaching here. Verse 36, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, who I've been talking about, whom you crucified, he has made him both Lord and Christ. You see, the goal of Peter's evangelistic preaching was to lead his fellow Israelites to know assuredly, not just know, but know with assurance, that's a faith description, that Jesus is Lord because he's at the right hand of God, and he is David's Lord, and he is Lord of all, Acts is going to go on to say, and he is Christ. He's the anointed one, the prophesied one, the Messiah, the true Messiah who was to come. Now, what is the difference between knowing the gospel and knowing it with assurance? You see, many people hear the gospel, but that doesn't mean they know it assuredly. You see the difference? To know with assurance is to believe. Because when you believe something, you're sure of it. Remember when Luke wrote to Theophilus, part one of his two-part work, Luke and Acts? He says in the prologue to Luke, Luke 1, verse 4, I'm writing these things that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. And I believe that Luke was writing to an unsaved Roman authority working below Caesar himself in Rome as an intake lawyer to represent the case before Caesar himself. That's who Theophilus probably was. And in the process, Luke is sharing the gospel with Theophilus, that Theophilus might come to faith in the Lord Jesus, the object of Luke and Acts. To not only know this information, but to know it with certainty, to be certain or assured of it himself. And particularly, what does Peter want these Jews in Jerusalem to be assured of? That Jesus is Lord and Christ. This reminds me of the purpose statement in the Gospel of John, a passage which all believers should know very well and have it memorized. John 20, verses 30 and 31. And many other signs besides, you know, the many that are recorded in the book. Truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these, these ones that I've selected, John says, they are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And what comes with believing that truth? And that believing you might have life through his name. We see here that Peter's evangelistic message in Acts 2 is no different than what the Gospel of John declares, as their Gospels were the same. In fact, we'll see as we go on in Acts that Peter's the mouthpiece, but who's there supporting him, standing by his side? It's John, repeatedly. They had the same gospel message. And what we learn from this is the content of Peter's evangelistic message so far, that it's centered in a person, namely Jesus Christ. He is Lord, he is Christ, and his work. He rose from the dead, and he died. Now, it does say in this passage, whom you crucified, verse 23, and I think his sacrificial work is implied, though not explicitly stated, because in verse 38 he's going to talk about the remission of sins that comes with a repentance or change of mind. Now how would they get the remission of sins? Because one died for their sins, namely Christ, the one who rose from the dead. So we see with the person of Christ that he is fully God. We see his deity as Peter preached it. We see his humanity as 
He is this man, verse 22 in this passage. He had a flesh, he had body, verses 30 and 31 say. You know, this wasn't Gnosticism, denying his true humanity. It wasn't like Jehovah's Witnesses today, denying his true deity. He was crucified, and by implication, it was a sacrificial death for our sins. And he rose from the dead. This is emphasized throughout. We also see the provision here of God's grace, as verse 38 is going to go on to talk about the gift of the Holy Spirit that will be given with forgiveness of sins. And then we see the condition to receive all of this and to receive Christ and salvation by grace. In this passage, verse 38 is going to say, repent. But, and then later it's going to be implied that it was through faith in the Lord Jesus. And I'll clarify that in a moment. So we see all the elements of the gospel here either stated explicitly or implicitly in this passage. But Peter has led them to this climactic point of verse 36, the true identity of the Lord Jesus. And what is their response to his preaching? Verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Cut to the heart. What does that mean? Well, it means they were convicted, particularly of their sin, of crucifying their Messiah. You talk about a case of mistaken identity. They had wrongly mistaken Jesus as a false Messiah. And here, their whole world comes crashing down on them. Are you kidding me? The one we've waited millennia for as Jews from the time of Abraham? <laughs> we've killed our Messiah? Oh. Now what do we do? That's their question. They are convicted. And by the way, before somebody can put their trust in the Lord Jesus as their Savior, don't they need to see that they need salvation or forgiveness from their sin? Absolutely. If a person cannot admit they're a sinner separated from God, worthy of his judgment, they'll never put their trust in Jesus Christ and receive it all of his grace. But I want you to notice here their follow-up question to Peter's preaching. And let's compare it with Acts chapter 16, verse 30. In chapter 2, verses 37 and 38, notice they say, What shall we do? Peter responds, verse 38, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in or literally upon the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, how does this compare with Acts 16, 30 and 31, where Paul is preaching to the Philippian jailer and gives them, him the condition to be eternally saved? <coughs> Notice verse 37 here. They say to Peter, or they say to Peter and the rest of the apostles, what shall we do? That's a broad question that includes not only the condition to be eternally saved, but now what must we do over and above salvation to publicly identify with our Messiah instead of reject him? That's where the baptism would come in. Repentance is a synonym or part of faith in the book of Acts, as we'll see. When a person believes in Jesus Christ, they've had a change of mind about him. That's repentance, change of mind. And usually people get baptized after they've believed. And that's exactly what's going to happen here on the day of Pentecost as 3,000 will get baptized. So this is a broad question, verse 37. But notice how it differs from Acts chapter 16, verse 30, where the Philippian jailer asks Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Specific statement, not a broad statement. What must I do to be saved? That's a very different question. And it's very important to note this difference. That's why Paul and Silas said to this Philippian jailer, verse 31, believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Nothing about baptism. Because baptism goes over and above the condition for salvation. Very important to note that distinction. And I say that because many fail to recognize that. And that leads us to point number seven here, that in Acts 
Peter answered their question by simply telling them to repent and be baptized just as Jesus Christ had instructed them in the Great Commission just days earlier. All Peter is doing is repeating what Jesus had told him to say and do. That's all. First he starts with repentance because in Luke's gospel, in his Great Commission statement in Luke 24, Luke has their repentance for remission of sins. Whereas when you look at Mark 16, Mark has believe the gospel, but in both cases, repentance precedes baptism, whether it's believing or repenting. And as I said already, you see in the book of Acts 11.21 or 20.21 that when a person puts their faith in Jesus Christ, they've had a change of mind about Jesus Christ. They have repented. So repentance is inherent to faith in Christ for salvation. But he goes on here and tells them, first of all, what you need to do is have a change of mind about your Messiah as you believe in him. Secondly, then, be water baptized. Now, what does water baptism do? Well, it doesn't remove sin. That's why someone has wisely said, you could be the wettest person in town, uh, get baptized in every church here in Duluth, and you won't come out any more saved than before you started. You'll be wetter, but not better. Because water can't remove a spiritual problem. Only the blood of Jesus Christ applied through faith on your part to you can remove your sin problem. So what does baptism do? Well, it simply provides a picture. Just like the Lord's Supper, another ordinance that we have from Christ, can picture Jesus Christ in his body. It's not his literal body. Well, baptism is the same way. It provides a picture. As somebody goes down into the water, they are picturing their identification or death with Christ, their burial with Christ under the water, and then they're raised up with Christ. That's what water baptism pictures. It pictures what the Holy Spirit baptism already accomplished for us the moment we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, because verse 38 is so often misinterpreted and misused, Let's just spend a little more time explaining this passage with the time we have left. First of all, there are those who use Acts 2.38 to teach that water baptism is necessary for eternal salvation. In fact, I found some of these images online. Here's one that says, God's simple plan for salvation. Well, really, if it's so simple, why does it take six steps? In fact, the last one, which is bolded, obedient until death. That doesn't sound very simple to me. And maybe you still think all this is pretty simple. You know, hear, believe, repent, confess, baptize, obedient unto death. Well, here's a flow chart having those same elements. Now, I look at that and I get a headache. How is that simple salvation? And notice what they have there in the middle. You must be baptized, Acts 2.38. And if you're not baptized, lost if you don't do any one of these, lost, 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 lost. That's not the biblical plan of salvation. So there are those who take Acts 2.38, what I would call the sacramental salvation view, or the baptismal regeneration view, that you've got to be water baptized to be born again. That's how they interpret verse 38, not true. In fact, in chapter 10 of Acts, Cornelius believes, he receives the Holy Spirit, and he hasn't even hit the water yet. You can read about it there before we even get there in our future study. Some say, well, you know, we don't believe in baptismal regeneration, but that, and that would be work salvation. So instead, baptism here must be a condition for fellowship for these Jews, that if they don't get water baptized, they couldn't have fellowship with the Lord. Really? Really? So they weren't in fellowship from the time they believed and had repented in their minds till they later got baptized that day? That doesn't make sense. No, I don't think baptism was a condition for fellowship here. Again, it just pictured to the rest of the Jews and the public their identification with Christ. Now, some who reject the baptismal regeneration view or baptism for fellowship view say, well, 
really what we need to do is just reinterpret one Greek preposition here and it solves everything. This is what I would call the causal ice view. Because verse 38 says, repent and be baptized for, and the Greek preposition is ice, for the remission of sins. And they say, well, there are some rare occasions in which in the Greek New Testament, ice can mean because of. So let's insert that here and voila, we've solved the passage. Repent, now you're saved, and be baptized because of the fact that you've already received remission of sins. Now, doctrinally, that fits with the rest of Scripture. But I think that's a lot of weight to put on one little preposition and make the whole interpretation stand on that rare view of ice. Similar to that is what has sometimes been called the parenthetical view, where verbs in Greek have number. They're either singular or plural, just like some other languages. So, for instance, in verse 38, repent is plural, and that makes sense. Peter's telling all the Jews, all of you need to change your mind. And then among those of you who've changed your mind, individually, be baptized. And that's in the singular. And then it goes on to say, and you shall receive, and that's plural, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so, so they say, and I, I held this view for years, that yeah, the Greek solves it, the plural versus the singular, because notice the gift of the Holy Spirit is attached not to baptism, but to repentance. And I think there's so, still some validity to that view, but I think a better interpretation is what I would call the Great Commission view. That all Peter was doing here again was repeating the condition set forth in the Great Commission. Not to be eternally saved, it goes beyond that. Christ is saying, for all those who've believed and are eternally saved, they should then, at some point, publicly identify with Christ via baptism. That's all. And by the way, this fits with the preposition that's used here, the little word epi, repent and let every one of you be baptized, literally upon epi, the name of Jesus Christ. And the name of Jesus Christ stands for both his person and his work. So in other words, have a change of mind about Christ, and then as you go get water baptized later, you are still resting upon the name of Jesus Christ, his person and his work. And all of that ties back to the change of mind and the resting upon, the reliance, dependence upon Christ that brings remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. By the way, that little preposition at P is the same preposition that's used in Acts 16.31. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You see, when we put our trust in Jesus Christ, we are literally resting or depending upon him to do the saving for us. We no longer trust or rest in ourself. And that fits how this little preposition is used with faith terms throughout the book of Acts. Furthermore, this great commission view fits with the context. There's an Israelite audience that was convicted, but they were not yet saved by verse 37. And so they still needed to be eternally saved. Repentance was the one condition slash faith. By the way, faith is implied in verse 41, later where it says, of those who received the word, they got baptized. And then a little bit later in chapter 2, verse 44, it says they, those who believed. Receiving, believing, repenting, those are all interchangeable terms to describe the one sole condition of faith alone in Christ alone to be saved. We've already seen that their question in verse 37, what shall we do, is broader than Acts 16.30. What must we do to be saved? And Peter and the apostles were recently given the Great Commission, which commands faith and repentance to be eternally saved or forgiven, and then followed by baptism. And that was just within the last 50 days. So it all fits, along with the Greek preposition epi, which stands for resting upon or relying upon. That is the connotation. And lastly, remission of sins elsewhere in Luke Acts is conditioned solely on faith and repentance. And you can see all the verses there that support that. Let me just make a couple more applications in closing here. As we go on, verse 39 and 40 say, For the promise is to you and to your children, he says to his audience, and to all who are afar off. And by the way, if you're here today and you have not put your trust in Jesus Christ alone, 
the promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit and remission of sins is to you as well. As many as the Lord our God will call, i.e. call through the gospel. Verse 40, and with many other words, he testified and exhorted them. In other words, this is just a summary of what he said here in chapter 2. And what did he say, exhorting them thereafter? Be saved from this perverse generation. He warned them. Just like Paul's preaching in Acts 16 of the gospel of grace ends with a warning. And there is a place to warn and exhort. Frankly, hell is real and it's a very long time and you don't want to go there. And you need to be saved. We need to tell people that. Because that is something that is denied today. And that is exactly why Christ came to die for each and every one of us. So what are some lessons we can learn in closing today about Peter's example of evangelism for us? Well, first of all, I would say this, that Peter gave his audience someone to believe in, a person, the Lord Jesus Christ, explaining who he is and what he has done for them. And what I have found over the years is that when we explain who Christ is and what his work accomplished, by the time we get to the sole condition of faith alone apart from works, it's a mopping up job. When they understand, for example, with the John 3.16 diagram we use, not only that there's a sin barrier and we're separated from God, but that Jesus Christ's work on that cross broke down that sin barrier and he rose from the dead and salvation is now a gift of his grace. It's received quite easily by faith at that point rather than people still relying on their works. So the emphasis should not be on the response to the gospel of faith alone, but on the person and work of the gospel or the good news. Secondly, we see that Peter here in Acts 2 used scripture throughout to support his gospel, which the Holy Spirit then used to convince people and lead them to Christ. Do you know the word of God like Peter knew it? Man, he was quoting and referring to passage after passage. He was on his toes, ready to go. And by the way, even as I think of this John 3.16 illustrated, if you don't know some basic scripture passages about the gospel, I would encourage you to get this sheet right here. It's right up next to the bookstore door in the upper hallway. You'll see it in the rack up there. And on the back, it has verses to fit all these categories here. Maybe memorize one from each category of the context for the gospel, the content of the gospel, the response, and the result. And maybe eventually just memorize all those verses that are listed there. That would be a great place for you to start. Thirdly, we see here in Acts 2 that Peter was a spirit-filled vessel who spoke with boldness. What a contrast between him sitting around the campfire in the courtyard denying Christ three times to now speaking to 3,000 boldly and them getting saved. Where does our boldness come from? Not in our ability, dear saints, but in the truth of the gospel and the Spirit of God indwelling us. That's where Peter's strength came from and boldness. Lastly, we see that Peter challenged people and appealed to their volition and willingness to believe and be saved. And we need to do that in our appeal when we give the gospel as well. A lot to learn here in this passage. Let's close with prayer. Father, thank you for your word today and the wonderful truth it contains. A lot here in this passage. May we just take these truths and by your grace and spirit see them applied in our life. And we pray this and ask this now in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.